we'll talk about the differences between the primary and the permanent dentition. As you know, primary or the deciduous teeth is the precursor to the permanent dentition. They are smaller, they are present in the childhood and they are important for giving the functions of an oral cavity to a child before the permanent teeth comes in when the jaw is much bigger. So overall we will be looking at the morphological, radiological and histological differences between the deciduous and the permanent teeth. So as you all know, the deciduous teeth is 20 in number and permanent teeth is 32 in number. Total human beings have 52 teeth. The deciduous teeth do not have a premolar. So if you look at the dental formula, it is 2102, which accounts for two incisors, one canine, and two deciduous molars. Whereas the permanent teeth has 2123 as the formula, which is two incisors, one canine, two premolars, and a molar in each quadrant. And when you look at the tooth numbering systems also, the three predominant systems that we use are the universal, Zygmunt de Palmer, and the FDI system. The universal and the Zygmunt de Palmer system use alphabets. So we use the alphabets A, B, C, D, E in the Zygmunt de Palmer system, which represents the incisors, canine, and the molars. And in the universal system, we start from A to 20 alphabets, starting from the upper right quadrant, going down to the lower right quadrant. Whereas for the permanent teeth, we use the numbers 1 to 8 in each quadrant. The FTI system, which divides them into the quadrants, they use numbers to represent each tooth, 1 to 8 in the permanent and 1 to 5 in the deciduous, but the quadrants are numbered 5, 6, 7, 8 in deciduous and 1, 2, 3, 4 in the permanent. So, of course, you know that. Chronologically, the primary teeth occurs and develops much earlier. In 14 weeks in utero itself, it develops and the only permanent teeth which tends to form before birth or at birth is the permanent first molar. The eruption starts from 6 months and completes by 2.5 years for the primary teeth whereas the permanent teeth starts at 6 years and the third molar can form up to 23 years of age. Because of this sequential formation of tooth and eruption sequence, this has been used for age estimation procedures. So the primary teeth can be used for age estimation procedures in children and the permanent teeth can be used for age estimation procedures in the adults. Following the eruption of the teeth, the root is still not complete. The root is still open. It takes nearly one and a half to two years for the primary teeth to complete the root apex. Whereas the permanent teeth takes nearly four years after the eruption has been completed. Of course, the primary teeth is smaller than the permanent teeth. And the primary teeth accommodates itself very well in the horseshoe shaped small jaw. Whereas the permanent teeth accommodates itself in the large jaw which develops with growth. The primary teeth are considered to be more white in color. Some people attribute it to the amount of enamel that is present. Some consider it as the mineralization that is present. But overall, the primary teeth has thinner enamel and is whiter in color. Hence, while selecting shades of composites and veneers in children, you will have a whiter shade or a brighter shade compared to the permanent teeth, which is slightly yellowish because of the excessive amount of dentin that is present, which reflects through the translucent enamel. Cervically, the deciduous teeth are much narrower than the permanent teeth. There is a cervical constriction that is seen. I will show a photograph of a teeth in the next few slides. Whereas in the permanent teeth, the constriction is not so prominent. We will discuss this point later on in one of the pictures. The enamel thickness varies from 0.5 to 1.5 mm in the primary teeth, whereas it is up to 2.5 mm in the permanent teeth. And of course, the permeability is also more in the primary teeth. Hence, primary teeth is more prone 
for dental caries because it easily easily allows the penetration of the acidic environment. The primary teeth is less mineralized, more prone for attrition and decay. Permanent teeth is more mineralized and less chances of attrition taking place. Now here is the comparison of an E and a 6 of the maxillary quadrant. In the two images that you see, they look pretty much similar. And you can see the cusp of Kerabili in the permanent teeth and a similar counterpart in the deciduous teeth. There is an oblique ridge here in both the teeth, but overall the tooth has a similar outline. But when you look at the four different cusps in a deciduous teeth, the size variation is not so prominent. Here you can make out that the mesiopalatal cusp is substantially bigger than the other three. The next cusp is the mesiobuccal cusp followed by the distobuccal cusp and then the distolingual cusp. The smallest is the cusp of Kerabili. But if you look at this deciduous teeth here, the two buccal cusp seems to be of almost the same size. Of course, the mesiopalatal cusp is bigger. So you can see that the size variation among the cusps is not so prominent in a deciduous teeth. Same thing will happen with a mandibular second molar, also the deciduous counterpart. So we were talking about the cervical constriction here. So here you can make out that morphologically the neck of the deciduous teeth is much more narrower and the convergence which takes place from the incisal edges or the contact areas is much more prominent than the permanent counterpart. So if you look at the deciduous teeth, now the deciduous teeth here has a very unique feature. The mesiodistal width is actually larger than the cervical incisal width. So the tooth is stouter than the length, the crown portion. But this is not the case in the permanent teeth. The permanent teeth is substantially longer than the mesiodistal width. So if someone asks you which is this particular tooth, a non-comparative variable would be the cervical incisal to the mesiodistal dimension ratio. So if you look at the primary central incisor, the crown length or the cervical incisor length is 6 mm and the mesiodistal dimension is larger than that, 6.5 mm. So looking at one single tooth, you will be able to identify whether it is deciduous or permanent. But if you look at the permanent teeth, it's 10.5 mm long and 8.5 mm wide. So it's a very substantial fact that you should keep in mind. The cervical constriction is prominent also in the buccolingual segment. And you can see that there is a very prominent bulge that you see in the cervical portion. This cervical bulge is very prominent in the deciduous teeth and it also plays an important role in giving anchorage to a crown. So when you place a metallic crown on top of a deciduous teeth, this particular contour enables the fixation of the particular crown very easily. Among the posterior teeth, here you have three pictures. The deciduous D, E, and the permanent 6. The buccal and the lingual outlines just above the contact point or the cervical bulge, contact points on the mesial and the distal aspect, and the bulge in the buccal segment predominantly, is almost straight in the primary teeth, but it is much more curved in a permanent teeth. So if you look at this particular portion here, it's very straight, but here it is curved. The occlusal table is narrower buccolingually. So if you look at this particular tooth, this is wider buccolingually, narrower mesiodistally. Now here you can make out that it is wider mesiodistally, narrower buccolingually. The cusp sizes are smaller and less pronounced cusp ridges, whereas the permanent teeth shows very prominent 
triangular, oblique, and the cusp edges. The grooves and depressions in the permanent teeth are more prominent and grotesque, whereas primary teeth is not very prominent. The contact areas on either side are much broader in the primary teeth and present more gingivity. The permanent teeth, the contact areas are present more occlusive. When you look at the B and the E, E is bigger. The second molar is bigger than the deciduous first molar. That is not the case with the permanent teeth. The permanent first molar is the biggest, followed by the second molar and then third molar. The roots also are different in a deciduous teeth. The deciduous teeth needs to accommodate the permanent successor that is going to come in that location. So to accommodate this, the anterior teeth, the apical portion of the root is more labially placed so that the permanent teeth can sit right under that. Similarly, the posterior teeth, the roots are flaring. It allows the premolars to sit in between. And the resorption that takes place in a deciduous teeth is physiological phenomenon because we need to shed the deciduous teeth so that the permanent teeth can come in that location. Whereas the permanent teeth root resorption is pathological in nature. And the root trunk, which is nothing but the area from the cervical line to the site of bifurcation, is much more prominent in a permanent teeth. The root trunk, because of the flaring of the roots, is much more smaller and narrower in a deciduous teeth. So let's have a look at this particular radiograph. So this radiograph is a feature of a mixed dentition individual and if you look at any of these quadrants, let's look at this quadrant here, you can see that the permanent centrals have come, the permanent lateral has come, the 6 is here. So even though the eruption has taken place, you can see that the root apex is still not complete. So in a permanent teeth, it takes up to 4 years after eruption the apex to be complete. You can see the premolars are sitting right under the deciduous D and E and you can see the flaring nature of the root which allows the premolars to be placed right under that. So when you look at this configuration we get an idea about the pulp chamber. So when you look at the pulp horns in a deciduous teeth they are much more sharper and high placed in a primary teeth compared to a permanent teeth. In a permanent teeth, you have a lot of space in dentine. So when you are preparing a cavity on top, you don't have to worry about exposing the pulp horn. Whereas in a deciduous teeth, you may have a higher chance of exposure to the pulp horns. The root canals are also thin and divergent in a deciduous teeth. Obviously, it follows the root that is divergent. In a permanent teeth, it is much more broader at the site of contact with the coronal pulp and it becomes narrower at the apical portion. The root canal entrances are not clearly defined in a deciduous teeth. So when you are actually opening an access to clean up the root canal, you may find it difficult in a deciduous teeth. Whereas a permanent teeth is very clearly defined. The molar root canals are thin ribbon like whereas here it is a nice tube like structure. The pulp chamber proportionally is very large compared to the size of the tooth. That is not the case with the permanent teeth. The thickness of the dentine between the enamel and the pulp is much lesser. That is why there is a higher chance of exposure of the pulp in a deciduous teeth cavity preparation, not in the permanent teeth. Histologically also there are differences not only in enamel but also in dentine, pulp and cementum. Of course, we have discussed that dentine and enamel thickness is much lesser in a deciduous teeth. Not only this, the number of enamel rods that are there that is also lesser in a deciduous teeth. A most important configuration is the direction of the enamel rods. So if you look at any of these rod directions in a deciduous teeth, 
they are nice and flaring in all the directions so in the cusp tips they are going upward and outward when it comes to the middle portion of the crown and the cervical portion they are horizontally placed in a permanent teeth however the cusp tips remain similar to that of a deciduous teeth but in the cervical portion they are directed more obliquely and the enamel rods at the surface are apically placed compared to the dentin enamel junction this plays an important role in cavity preparations so when you are preparing a cavity in the cervical third of a permanent teeth you need to give a bevel in the cervical portion whereas in a deciduous teeth you need not do that if you do not give a bevel in the permanent teeth you may lead to an unsupported enamel rods being present which leads to secondary caries formation in that area the primary teeth the gnarled enamel is usually absent the gnarled enamel is nothing but twisting of the enamel rods that take place in the cusp tips so this is the dentine apex and the cusp tip you can see the twisting of the enamel rods permanent teeth usually have this the neonatal line is usually present in all the primary teeth the neonatal line is a line that is formed because of an accentuation of the stria flexus before the birth of the child in a concealed environment within the womb the enamel is formed much more uniformly but because of the physiological changes of birth and nutrition the enamel rods form in a different way after birth so a line here represented by the alphabet a an accentuated stria flexus is noted so the prenatal enamel and the postnatal enamel are separated now this is possible only when the tooth forms before as well as after the birth of the child which can happen in all the primary teeth as the first evidence of calcification happens in utero whereas in a permanent teeth only the permanent first molars can show a neonatal line the incremental lines are much more rhythmic when it is found before the neonatal line this is mainly because of the controlled environment that the mother's womb provides for the development of the tooth there is no such rhythmicity present for the permanent teeth except of course for the first molar the other histological differences include the thickness of the dentine is lesser the number of dentinal tubules are lesser also the length of the dentinal tubules are shorter the cores of the dentinal tubules are irregular whereas you see a very typical sinusoidal dentine structure in the permanent teeth the neonatal lines are always present in dentine also whereas in the permanent teeth only the first molar can show a neonatal line the dentino enamel junction is scalloping in both but is more pronounced in the deciduous teeth than in the permanent teeth the cemento dentinal junction is also scalloped in the primary teeth whereas it is straight in a permanent teeth the pulp cavity is comparatively larger in a primary teeth and we have spoken about the high and sharper primary pulp cavity because of which you can have a higher risk of exposure during cavity preparation the apical foramen is much more wider the cells are more in the primary teeth whereas the permanent teeth is a little more fibrous having type 3 and type 1 collagen fibers the cell free zone of wheel is rarely seen in a primary teeth in a permanent teeth is always seen and the pulp cavity does not show calcifications and is obliterated by the pulp stones in the permanent teeth not in the primary Thank you.